Welcome to everyone who's joining us for session 151. And um, today's session is going to be about approaches for RAI therapy and RAI refractory non-AVID RAI resistant disease. And our featured speaker this afternoon is Mabel Ryder, MD. And I would like to give you a little background about her. She is an endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She earned her medical degree from the University of Texas and completed her fellowship in residency at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Dr. Ryder specializes in head and neck cancer and nuclear medicine therapy. She has contributed to many publications on thyroid cancer. Dr. Ryder is a 2007 FICA Research Grant recipient, and we are so lucky to have her with us this afternoon. And with that, I'm going to let Dr. Ryder take it away. So with that, welcome, Dr. Ryder. We're anxious to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you for the introduction. And it continues to be a privilege to be a part of this FICA annual um, conference. Um, I spoke on this topic last year. If it's uh, some of you are um, repeat attenders, then hopefully this will be a nice summary and uh, review of that. And if you're new, I hope you find this information helpful. And I'm certainly happy to um, answer questions if we get to them at the end. This is a pretty broad topic uh, as well, both approaches for radioiodine therapy and then approaches for radioiodine refractory disease. But fortunately, throughout the conference um, developed by Dr. B uh, by Gary Bloom, I think you, it's a really fantastic opportunity to learn the spectrum of different approaches for thyroid cancer. I have no uh, relevant disclosure, no financial disclosures, and um, I will talk about uh, off-label therapies perhaps at the end, briefly. And the objectives for my talk are to help under uh, help everyone understand clinical uses for radioiodine therapy, uh, define radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer, and then understand approaches for those that disease that is uh, doesn't respond to radioiodine. In one, just uh, one or a few brief slides, um, as we talk about radioactive iodine, I show a cartoon here of the thyroid cell, which is purpose is to make thyroid hormone, T4 and T3. And it needs iodide uh, and an iodine pump in order to make thyroid hormone. This is T4 here. It has four iodine um, uh, molecules to it. And because of this feature, can you hear me okay? okay. Because yes. of this feature, um, uh, we can use this therapeutically it, when we talk about thyroid cancer. So there's an iodide pump that takes up iodine and it makes thyroid hormone. And then there's this protein, thyroglobulin, that helps hold on to the thyroid hormone within what we call the colloid, helps store this. And this can also be used and is often used in thyroid cancer um, follow-up. When we're talking about approaches for iodine, we're talking specifically about approaches for what we call differentiated thyroid cancer. These are thyroid uh, cancers that have a thyroid likeness with responsiveness to TSH, secretion of thyroglobulin often, and the ability to target iodine in that iodide channel. And these specifically are cancers, differentiated thyroid cancers called papillary, and there's many different types. There's follicular thyroid cancers, purple cell thyroid cancers, and poorly differentiated. There's a few other subcategories here, but these are the main ones when we're thinking about differentiated thyroid cancer and thinking about approaches for radioiodine. And iodine has been um, a longstanding target or treatment strategy for thyroid cancer because this pump is located within the thyroid cells and, th and many thyroid cancer cells can retain this pump and it takes up iodine, we can then use this to um, deliver radioactive iodine in the form of I-131 to kill those thyroid specific cells. So this is a very specific targeted therapy using the iodine channel. 
Unfortunately, not all of the types of thyroid cancer that we just mentioned are responsive. The ones that are more likely to have higher sensitivity, at least initially, are papillary thyroid cancers and follicular thyroid cancers. The other cancers, herpal cell and poorly differentiated, often have limited and low sensitivity to radioactive iodine. And I could actually also put tall cell variant down in this category because it's only a minority that tend to be highly sensitive to radioiodine. And we'll talk about why that may mean for some of these cancers toward the end. So our applications for radioactive iodine in DTC or differentiated thyroid cancers are we can use iodine to detect, we can use the iodine pump to detect thyroid cancer. So using whole body scans with low doses of um, I-131, one to three millicuries, we can find where the cancer is. We can also then use I-131 at higher doses, say over 30 millicuries, to treat advanced thyroid cancers. So both diagnostic and treatment. And as we talk about approaches, I like to give case presentations to help illustrate how we think about iodine in the clinic. So this is a 25-year-old patient who had an incidental thyroid nodule found on a CT for workup of neck pain. This is a pretty common scenario, an incidental finding of a nodule. On ultrasound shown here, the nodule was suspicious. It's darker than the normal thyroid here. It has little specks of calcium. It's irregular. This looks like a papillary thyroid cancer on imaging. Under the microscope, when we do a fine needle aspiration, it has the classic features of papillary thyroid cancer that pathologists look for. It's got what these called are pseudo inclusions. It's got grooves. It's got altered nuclei. This is a pattern recognition that tells us this is positive for papillary thyroid cancer. This patient underwent a near total thyroidectomy after her biopsy, and the final pathology confirmed a 2.1 centimeter papillary thyroid cancer. There was no um, extension of the cancer or growth outside of the thyroid. It was confined to the thyroid, and none of the lymph nodes that were removed were involved. After surgery, four to eight weeks later, her thyroglobulin, which becomes a tumor marker after the no near total thyroidectomy, was nice and low. So this is stage one or T2 N0 M0 disease. And prognosis for this patient based on Mayo data and MASIS scoring, a different prognostic um, tool was less than six. And so based on this, we ask ourselves, is there a role for radioactive iodine, either a scan or therapy? Would this patient benefit? Um, and so again, we're talking about using iodine to detect whether there's residual cancer, meaning an I-123 that we use at Mayo or other places use I-131 for scans. And should we give this patient a dose after surgery of radioactive iodine? When we think about different doses of iodine, I break it down in my mind into three different categories where we use treatment, therapeutic doses of I-131 as ablation. That's to kill residual normal thyroid tissue that's left behind. Or we think about adjuvant therapy where a patient perhaps we think after surgery has some microscopic residual cancer cells that are left behind. So that's called adjuvant therapy. And then there's therapeutic I-131. When we know the patient has disease left behind, say in some lung nodules, they take up iodine. And so we want to use I-131 therapeutically to kill cells that we know represent thyroid cancer. So for this patient, going back to um, our question, do any of these treatment approaches fit or benefit this patient? Well, data from the Mayo Clinic and others, but here from E and Hay, showed that for low risk disease with MESA scores that are under six, the prognosis or survival of patients with this level of stage one low risk disease is excellent. And the risk of dying from this thyroid cancer is very low. 
And that's what these curves represent here, outcomes over 10, 15, 20, and even 25 years. That for low risk disease represented up here, survival is excellent. As the disease becomes more advanced and the MESA score or the distant disease develops, then prognosis can be reduced. Dr. Hay also looked at data such as this patient who had disease not spread to lymph nodes and not, no distant disease. So does radioactive iodine ablation versus no ablation change tumor recurrence rates? And what he showed that in over 600 patients, some who got iodine, some who didn't get iodine, that there was no difference in recurrence rates of the tumor. So this is really reassuring and suggests that there may be limited benefit for I-131 after surgery for patients with low risk disease. And this is that same data shown in um, another manner that looking at 20 year overall survival and looking at 20 year recurrence rates, meaning does the cancer come back in patients who had no lymph nodes versus patients who did have lymph nodes those without iodine and those with iodine, that the outcomes were excellent in, in the both populations. And the recurrence rate did not change with a dose of radioactive iodine in these low risk patients. So we now fast forward a few, um, several years ago in 2012, data published in the New England Journal of Medicine from two different randomized studies showed that in low-risk patients, they compared 30 millicuries versus 100 millicuries of radioactive iodine in low-risk patients, and there were no differences in outcomes in a higher dose versus a lower dose. So until recently, if you are going to receive or consider a dose of radioactive iodine for low-risk disease, we would rec have recommended 30 millicuries. At Mayo, we often do um, minimal or no radioiodine, but if a patient elects it and was interested in a dose of iodine, we would consider 30 millicuries. And now we fast forward even later to the present time, 2022, and this recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine again, now compared outcomes of no radioactive iodine to those with radioactive iodine again, in low-risk patients. So this is different than the prior studies from Ian Hay. That was retrospective or looking back data. This is for the first time a randomized study with three years follow-up in 300 patients without iodine, 300 patients with iodine. And they found that no radioactive iodine was the same as those patients who got iodine. So it was non-inferior. So overall, the data suggests that for low-risk patients, um, such as in this scenario, prognosis and survival is excellent. The risk for thyroid cancer coming back is low. That 30 millicuries, if using the a treatment, is a reasonable dose as opposed to higher doses. And that um, if you're going to do iodine, it might, some people elect to do it because of using a tumor marker, but we can talk about that later. But ultimately, most patients may not benefit from an ablation dose. So for this patient, typically at the Mayo Clinic in particular, we would not recommend post-operative radioactive iodine because prognosis is excellent. But now we're gonna shift the same case, a patient who was presented with a palpable nodule, this patient now has suspicious nodules on ultrasound and has abnormal lymph nodes. It's a little bit different than the last patient. Pathology showed a 3.7 centimeter PTC. There were 12 positive lymph nodes. The largest lymph nodes is 3.2 centimeters. And the post-operative tumor marker thyroglobulin is 1.2. So is there a role for radioiodine in this case? Data from Greg Randolph at Mass General showed that when you have more than five lymph nodes involved, or if those nodes are palpable on exam or seen easily on ultrasound, the risk for recurrent disease can be as high as 20%, maybe even up to um, 40%. So in these patients, we think there's high risk of residual disease after surgery. 
and in patients with a lot of lymph nodes, there may be a role for adjuvant treatment. Adjuvant again means after surgery, there might be microscopic residual thyroid ca cancer cells left behind such that a dose of iodine might reduce recurrence rates. And so this is adjuvant therapy. And this is an example of a patient who has thyroid bed uptake, may also have some uptake in lymph node micrometastasis, such that iodine may target that and help prevent a future lymph node or neck recurrence. So adjuvant I-131 therapy, the optimal dose for what adjuvant therapy is in intermediate to high risk for recurrence is not well established. We don't have clinical trials telling us what the best dose is. Most clinicians or endocrinologists and nuclear medicine doctors uh, consider doses between 75 and 150 millicuries. My doses are often between 75 and 100 millicuries in most patients. And um, it's intended, again, to reduce recurrences, we say, to patients by 50%. But I also tell patients that we don't really know that that's well established, that recurrence rates are reduced by 50%. So the next scenario, then, we've talked about iodine for ablation. We've talked about iodine for adjuvant therapy. And now we're going to demonstrate iodine as a therapeutic um, option for patients with established distant disease. So this is a case, a previous patient of mine, 61 year old female who was found to have incidental lung nodules. And these lung nodules are shown here. They're pretty tiny. She underwent biopsy of one of these and it was found to be very well differentiated thyroid cancer. So she did undergo a near total thyroidectomy. After surgery, her thyroglobulin, which became a tumor marker, was 21 with a TSH of 2. So clearly for this patient, we would all recommend an iodine whole body scan. And if the scan is positive, I-131 therapy. So here we're talking about using I-131 to kill a known residual or metastatic thyroid cancer, meaning macroscopic cancer that we can see that has spread outside of the thyroid. So this patient underwent an iodine whole body scan. And this is what we really hope to see in, I wish, all of my patients who had advanced thyroid cancer. I wish there was this degree of uptake like this patient had, but this is a clear example of what Laura Bukai from Memorial Sloan Kettering would call an exceptional, an exceptional REI uptake and responder to radioiodine therapy. This patient went on to receive um, radioactive iodine and had a near complete response of these tiny lung nodules that nearly disappeared and her tumor marker became undetectable. And she's had a sustained response for many, many years. In fact, she hasn't returned to see me because she's done so well. And this is her scan six months later, that that nodule here became that, and this nodule here became this tiny, and her tumor marker became undetectable. So this is really the definition of radioiodine avid disease. And these patients have an excellent outcome when they respond this favorably. What is then radioiodine refractory disease? We talked about the three approaches for radioactive iodine. We talked about the excellent responder. But unfortunately, this disease is such that many patients who have advanced disease often become refractory or the iodine doesn't work. So another case example, a patient of mine, 58-year-old female who presented with cough, wheezing, and hoarseness. She was bound to have palpable nodules on exam and on ultrasound. She had vocal cord paralysis as the tumor was invading her recurrent laryngeal nerve. And on CT scan that had been done for her wheezing, she had these lung nodules consistent with metastatic thyroid cancer. Her surgery uh, was done well. She had a 2.6 centimeter papillary thyroid cancer but she did have a focus of what of more advanced disease called poorly differentiated. The tumor was escaping outside of the thyroid to invade the trachea. She had several positive lymph nodes in addition to these lung nodules. 
Unfortunately, on iodine whole body scan, there was no uptake within any of these lung nodules of iodine. She nonetheless did receive a dose of radioactive iodine um, and received even a second dose of radioactive iodine. And unfortunately, there was no response of her disease in the lungs to the radioiodine. And this could have been predicted by her scan here being negative within the lungs. In most patients, with the exception of young patients, when you have lung disease that doesn't take up iodine on a diagnostic scan, it often doesn't respond to empiric doses as was given here. So this is defined then as radioiodine refractory disease. It's the absence of iodine uptake on a pre or post therapy scan. It's disease progression after you give a therapeutic dose of radioiodine. Or often what's used is PET scans. So if you have what we call glucose or sugar avid disease on a PET scan, it predicts less responsive disease to radioactive iodine. So what are our options for iodine refractory disease? This is the second part of my talk today. To illustrate that, we'll talk about a third patient of mine, a 49-year-old patient who presented with um, uh, dysphonia, hoarseness of his voice. He was found on imaging to have this mass in what we call the thyroesophageal groove. It was hot on PET scan along with lung nodules here. His biopsy was positive for thyroid cancer and he underwent total thyroidectomy. Um, pathology showed a poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, and an iodine whole body scan showed some uptake in the neck, mostly on the left side, none in the right side where he had his primary tumor. The lung nodules that he had on CT, unfortunately, were not iodine avid. It did not take up iodine. But given his high risk disease, we gave him an, an empiric dose of I 131. And unfortunately, within one month, his disease within the lungs progressed. He developed a cough due to disease um, affecting his airway. He developed new disease and fluid in the lung, and he developed a new adrenal mass. And again, this was within one month of iodine. So he meets the criteria for radioiodine refractory disease. So in my patients, where I have a joint appointment in oncology, I then look at different, um, these options for patients who have REI refractory disease. Should we just suppress the TSH alone and do surveillance? Is the patient a candidate for what we call multi-kinase inhibitors, such as lenvatinib? Is there a role to do what we call mutation testing on the tumor tissue to help identify additional treatment strategies? And is there any additional role for radioiodine therapy not as standard approaches, but as what we call radioiodine reuptake or redifferentiation. So when I see patients and we go through their scans, I think of three primary categories. When I think about their tumor volume, either they have very tiny distant disease that's low volume for which there's no symptoms, or they have very advanced disease on this spectrum symptomatic and large volume, high risk, or many of my patients fall in the middle where they have this macronodular disease. It's most often not symptomatic, but it's neither low volume nor high volume. So I try in my head to understand what is the volume of disease, what is their rate of growth of this disease, and how will therapy systemic options impact their goals of care, quality of life, and outcomes? For patients with advanced disease, lenvatinib is our first line option. It's very effective with 65% overall response rates. It works rapidly to control the disease within one to two months. It's not curative, but responses are often durable for one, two, three, or even more years in some patients. But there are many side effects that need to be aggressively managed in these patients, primarily um, high blood pressure, which can be quite dangerous, fatigue, poor appetite, weight loss, and nausea. 
So these are not easy drugs to take, but when you're in this category, it can really improve your quality of life. But if you have tiny disease that's not causing you symptoms, these treatments can impair your quality of life. And the patients in the middle are somewhere between those two categories. So for low risk disease, Systemic treatment is often greater risk than benefit. Whereas for advanced disease, systemic treatment is of clear benefit and even um, life-saving and prolonging. And the patients in the middle, it's intermediate risk disease. And whether there's benefits or risk is often the most challenging discussion and decision. And it, it's really an individualized decision that I have with patients in the clinic. Understanding goals of care, understanding how rapidly or not rapidly the disease is growing. We keep in mind that surveillance for thyroid cancer is a very reasonable option for many patients. Surveillance with what we call TSH suppression. So this is a patient that I demonstrated earlier with REI refractory disease. She was followed for over 10 years with just TSH suppression alone and a very good to excellent quality of life. Now, at some point in here, this disease by 2015 did become symptomatic and she was a candidate for systemic treatment, but she enjoyed many years without any drugs with just surveillance and thyroid hormone replacement and suppression alone. So many patients can do well with just surveillance. For symptomatic, so then for low risk, asymptomatic or um, low risk, slowly progressive disease, TSH suppression alone is very reasonable. And I see patients back every six months or nine months, and we walk through their scans and ensure that they are stable. And if they change, then we can change our course. If the disease does become rapidly progressive or if a patient presents with rapidly progressive disease, then this is clear. It's large volume, rapidly growing, symptomatic. So the disease then uh, needs to be treated here. So back to this patient who um, had surgery, had radioactive iodine and progressed. Um, this patient clearly does not need just TSH suppression alone. These non lung nodules developed within the course of one to two months after surgery and radioiodine. So this patient is clearly um, a candidate for lenvatinib, but there is a role for mutation screening. Um, that means studying the tissue DNA from his tumor to, to identify what is driving his cancer. So we call this genomic interrogations, where we under try to understand what are the mutations that are causing the cancer. And these mutations could become salvage treatments in the future for disease that becomes resistant to lenvatinib, or they could be alternatives to first-line lenvatinib because of perhaps better side effect profiles. So genomics have been well studied by um, this large study from 2014 with over 500 papillary thyroid cancers, and they confirmed that BRAF is the most common mutation in thyroid cancer, followed by mutations called RET fusions, and then followed by mutations in RAS. These are the drivers that cause the thyroid cancer to grow, to spread, and is what we'll talk about um, in the last few slides. It also probably leads to the loss of iodine uptake within papillary thyroid cancers. And that's why these cancers may lose their ability to respond and be killed by radioiodine. So this patient underwent Tempest testing. Tempest is the um, company I use, it's uh, a send out, and they do comprehensive gene panel testing of over 600 genes now um, uh, to identify what's uh, the driver of a patient's cancer. This patient was found, in fact, to have a RET fusion. Um, he had some other TERP mutations, which is common in advanced disease. And so the treatment options for this patient now included either first line lenvatinib or newer drugs at the time, this was two or three years ago, called selective RET kinase inhibitors. These are drugs that specifically target this mutation. After an individualized, personalized approach, the patient elected to go on a clinical trial. It was called Blue 667 with a drug pralacetinib. And this is a drug that targeted his RET mutation. 
And within one month, the patient had a near complete response of these lung nodules that essentially melted away. They're still there, we can't see them, but they um, had a significant shrinkage on treatment. So mutation targeted therapies targeting BRAF or fusions may be highly effective to shrink cancers. There may be fewer side effects than the traditional lenvatinib. Response rates appear to be durable, but these mutations are not common, at least the RET mutation. And we do expect that patients may eventually develop resistance to resistance. And this patient had a number of side effects to, these, to this drug where we had to manage those very carefully. But it's just to say that there are other options available. In addition to RET fusions, there are NTRK and TRK fusions, there are ALK fusions, and then there are now commonly BRAF mutations um, that are present. And actually, I have to update this slide because this mutation is common. And just within the last one to two months, drugs that target the BRAF mutation are now not off-label, but now FDA approved for advanced treatment of patients with BRAF mutant thyroid cancer or other cancers, BRAF mutant, that have failed first-line treatments. So our approaches have evolved for thyroid cancer um, and patients with advanced disease. So let's go back to this patient, the, perhaps sometimes the most challenging because we don't know when's the right timing for a patient here who has some macronodular disease, but is not symptomatic. When do we start treatment? Do we need to start treatment? These are um, often time consuming questions. So um, I'm gonna illustrate an example of this with a patient of mine, 64 year old with papillary thyroid cancer, underwent surgery and radioactive iodine. And on his scans, he was found to have uptake within the T-spine and some mild uptake within the lungs. After a second dose of iodine, he continued to have a slowly rising thyroglobulin and his lung nodules had not disappeared. So he came to see me for a second opinion. He's an engineer and he really didn't like his tumor marker rising and he wanted to do something about these nodules within his lungs. And so um, it brings up again, radio iodine refractory disease, because again, he's received two doses of iodine. His tumor marker is rising. The nodules haven't shrunk. Certainly he could continue to do TSH suppression alone because although his tumor marker is rising, those lung nodules are pretty tiny and he's not likely to have symptoms from that. He's not a candidate to me for lenvatinib yet because I think the risks are greater than the benefit. We can certainly do mutation testing on his tumor tissue to see if he has a targetable mutation. And then that mutation testing might help inform a new approach or a more recent approach with radioiodine redifferentiation. And let's go through that. So when we talk about the mutations here again that drive the majority of thyroid cancers, they signal through this pathway this pathway in the cell not only grows the tumor and causes it to spread and invade other structures, but this pathway shuts the gate off, if you will, or closes the gate to iodine. So these cells can't take up iodine. And if you stain these tumors under the microscope, they have lost the ability or they have lost the iodine channel. There's no staining, it would be brown. And in a patient with I-124 PET scan who has multiple lung nodules, there's no uptake in the lungs, driven because of this pathway shutting the gate to iodine. However, if you target this pathway, either the mutations directly or downstream, the pathway that the mutations signal through, you can open the gate back up. You can restore iodine as shown here by this um, iodine staining, where you can see iodine is now lining the cell's membranes. And in an I-124 PET scan, these now take up iodine. And this was really elegant data performed by um, Jim Fagan's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, showing that you can restore iodine uptake in patients with um, uh, BRAF mutant thyroid cancer, both in preclinical and then a clinical trial setting. So, 
This is an example of a patient from a clinical trial led by Alan Ho at MSKCC that shows before a special drug selumetinib, there was no iodine uptake. And after this special drug, there was increased iodine uptake. And this is just another example of another patient who had lung nodules, some of which did take up iodine, but hadn't responded to therapeutic I-131. After the drug selumetinib, which again blocks that um, pathway that we just talked about in the last slide that's driving the cancer and impairing iodine uptake, when you give a drug that um, blocks that pathway, you can restore iodine uptake even greater than what it was before. So back to this patient then who has some disease, but not advanced, but not the lowest risk disease, we now think about radioiodine redifferentiation as an approach for these patients. Rather than just surveillance alone, or maybe to delay the need for linbatinib, we might use radioiodine redifferentiation and I-131 um, either as part of a clinical trial or off-label approach to help shrink the disease and delay the need for linbatinib. The best candidates based on our data of about 30 to 35 patients are those who have iodine uptake previously, those who are more likely to be FTCs or follicular variants, those who have very high thyroglobulin levels, which can be a surrogate marker for iodine expression, RAS mutant tumors, or BRAF mutant tumors with high thyroglobulin. These might be candidates for redifferentiation. And so this engineering patient um, of mine had a RAS mutation, he had previous iodine uptake, and he did have a high thyroglobulin. So he elected to do trametinib, a drug that blocks this RAS mutation downstream, and repeat an iodine whole body scan. And he in fact had reuptake of iodine shown here on a SPECT CT. This is an iodine scan combined with a CT. And these red hot zones show increased iodine uptake that he had not had before. So we went on to treat him with I-131 and he had a mixed response. Many lung nodules shrank, but some of the other nodules that didn't have iodine uptake continued to grow, but slowly. So approaches for metastatic thyroid cancer then include TSH suppression, surveillance, mutation testing, or systemic treatment with pill treatments, and possibly a return to radioiodine therapy or targeted treatments if there's a specific mutation present. And that's it, that is um, my slides. I think I have talked sufficiently fast to be able to take questions um, from the audience. So. Um, it looks like it looks like you have several questions, about fifteen of them. So I'll okay. let you pick them and and uh, give it as much time as you can. And okay, we'll go from there. so I'm just going to start from the top and work my way through. So this top one looks a little bit lengthy. Let's see if we can summarize it. Um, one doctor says I cannot have another REI treatment. Um, there would be permanent side effects, loss of taste and smell. A second says it's not true at all. Um, first one is a world-renowned thyroid cancer specialist. I still have thyroglobulin um, after my REI treatments for papillary. It's in the range of ones to threes to fours. I finally had a PET scan, no cancer show, showed up. What should I do? So these are very good questions, and many patients are told that there's no more iodine that can be given. Um, in terms of that statement, I will say that there are times when there is a patient, I have at least one example of a patient who is an exceptional responder, who takes up iodine beautifully, and each time I gave her a dose of iodine, her tumor shrunk significantly. And she ultimately, ultimately received over a thousand millicuries in her lifetime. Now it is true, however, that the more iodine you're exposed to, the higher the risk for side effects. And the primary side effects are loss of um, saliva, so a dry mouth. And if that somehow affects your taste and smell, I suppose it's possible. But ordinarily it shouldn't affect smell. 
And ordinarily, it doesn't affect taste long term. In the short term, yes, it can. The real question is, does a patient respond to iodine the first time? If the tumor marker improved after the dose of iodine, and if not just tumor marker, but the imaging improved, so lung nodule shrunk, then that is a potential candidate for a second dose of iodine. But sometimes the first dose can get rid of all the disease that is sensitive to iodine, and what's left behind is that's the disease that's not sensitive. And so there, the iodine whole body scan is helpful. And unless you're a very young patient in your 20s, if the iodine whole body scan is negative, there's often less benefit from an empiric dose of I-131. So the complex answer is multiple doses of iodine are possible only if there's response to the prior dose of iodine. And more often, we and others in this field are turning to redifferentiation that I just am showing on this slide in the background if and when we're going to consider a second dose because we're learning about the biology of thyroid cancer and why it doesn't take up iodine. So hopefully I've answered that question. Um, yes, and the that next was a two-part question. That next one is, is a follow-up from the first. So I think I've answered the two-part question both through my talk and in my answer here. So um, I think we've answered both of those. So again, you can receive more than one dose, but you really want to have evidence that the last dose worked. There are increased risks of side effects, primarily to your salivary glands and a dry mouth. Um, after my first CT scan, I realized I uh, was allergic to IV contrast. Will this be an issue in regards to radioiodine therapy? This is a great question. We get this um, sometimes intermittently. And the answer is no, because the iodine that is given as part of CT scan is a very high iodine load. Um, it's very supra, supra physiologic uh, levels of iodine. The doses that we use for radioiodine scans and treatment are much, much um, different compared to the IV contrast load. And so in reality, you will not have likely an allergy to this. And I've never seen an allergy to I-131. Keep in mind that you're taking thyroid hormone, which has iodine in it. So that's another proof of principle that at physiologic levels, there isn't an allergy to iodine. But at IV contrast loads, which are very high, there is um, potential for allergies. Is the iodine used for the whole body scan radioactive? So um, we at Mayo use I-123 for our diagnostic scan. Other centers use I-131 for diagnostic scans because it's a lot cheaper, but the doses that they use um, are um, very low and, does, and they're, while I-131 is radioactive, it's not considered um, radiation uh, radiating you because it's such a low dose. So for diagnostic purposes, there aren't specific radiation safety precautions or risks to other people. Um, no flow chart RT on process. I'm not sure, unfortunately, I understand that comment or the question. Um, so we'll go on to, so sorry, Nick, I'm not sure I understand your question, but um, Christopher has a question. Why don't we have better data on the effectiveness of adjuvant therapy in intermediate risk cases? Where does reduction of 50% recur come from if we do not have data to prove it? Over the last five years, the amount of I-131 dose used has dramatically decreased, and it seems even more unclear at this point if there's any real benefit. Since almost everyone got REI years ago, it seems we are lacking data on intermediate risk that did not receive iodine? Are there any studies currently underway to evaluate this? So this is an excellent question. And in fact, um, we are doing, um, I have a fellow at Mayo who's doing a retrospective study to try and answer the question about the role of adjuvant therapy. Because at the Mayo Clinic, we have a heterogeneous group of endocrinologists where about a small group treat with iodine, Another group doesn't treat with iodine for patients with nodal disease. That's what I'm defining as intermediate for recurrence 
risk. And so we have at least retrospectively a cohort where we'll be able to look at recurrences and see did those who got iodine versus those who didn't get iodine benefit. Ian Hayes data, who's already looked at this and published even more recently, has looked at just intermediate risk patients, those who have positive lymph nodes. Some got iodine, some did not. And his data shows that there was no difference in recurrences for those who did and didn't get iodine. The challenge with prospective studies is it requires randomization, patients to not get iodine versus patients to get iodine. And historically, endocrinologists traditionally give radioactive iodine, at least outside of the Mayo Clinic, for nodal positive disease. Now that our um, approaches are changing and we're doing retrospective data, we might be able to do a prospective study. And with funding, that would be great to do this study. Um, but these studies often have to be done for five to 10 years to really follow outcomes, at least to five years, that would be um, the ideal. And it's just very expensive and um, requires a lot of um, support to do a randomized placebo control trial for this um, question. All right, next question. Um, I'm four months out from a therapeutic dose of 150 millicuries, um, seven centimeter nodule, 20 lymph nodes, was inpatient for radioiodine and hospital forgot to take my post-therapy thyroglobulin levels. Um, Follow-up scans looked all right for now. What questions should I be asking? Any thoughts on when I should get my next follow-up scan? Um, so again, this is a hard one. There's some incomplete information here, but um, typically after um, treatment for seven centimeter cancer and positive lymph nodes, I often see a patient back six months later after their radioiodine. I would do imaging of the neck. I often do a CT of the lungs. Actually, the CT of the lungs often comes with part of our iodine whole body scan that we do um, because that helps tell me whether there are any lung nodules. And um, having a thyroglobulin, whether pre or post um, radioiodine is helpful because then you can try and gauge whether there's a change in that tumor marker after surgery. But either way, you have to follow disease both biochemically by the thyroglobulin if it's useful, and structurally by imaging, meaning CT scans and neck ultrasounds. And I myself tend not to repeat an iodine whole body scan unless there's still disease and assuming the last dose, 150 millicuries, helped that existing disease. If six months, a year later, the tumor marker is rising, or lung nodules are growing, then it did not respond to that 150 millicuries and there's limited benefit in repeating a standard whole body scan. And that's when I might look at genetic studies, what's driving the tumor, and think about the three different categories that I just talked about. What is the volume of disease? What's the rate of growth? And maybe just thyroid hormone replacement alone is needed. So I hope I answered that question sufficiently. Celeste has a question to clarify, seven centimeter nodule was fully cancerous. Yeah, same reply. I would say Celeste that it's important to get imaging of the lungs and see if there's any thyroid cancer beyond the neck in the lungs or bones. The iodine scan can be useful for that, but remember when the scan is negative, there, it's either there's no disease or there may be disease that doesn't take up iodine. So often a CT scan may be helpful. So Tina has a question. Oops. Um, when tumor marker becomes slightly detectable after five years post-surgery and removal of lymph nodes and had iodine and has BRAF, does this mean the cancer has returned? Because of BRAF, will REI work in the future if the cancer returns? So, so this is basically to summarize the patient's had surgery, had had a dose of radioactive iodine, we know it's BRAF mutant, and five years later, the tumor marker is positive. So generally, if the thyroglobulin becomes positive with negative thyroglobulin antibodies, 
that is uh, an indication there might be recurrence of thyroid cancer. Depending on the level of thyroid globulin, if ones or twos, it may be just confined to the neck. The neck is the most common place of recurrence. So we'd recommend a high resolution neck ultrasound that does lymph node mapping. The disease might be microscopic and the thyroglobulin might be the first place um, to find early signs of this. So if the neck ultrasound is negative, I might repeat an ultrasound in six months along with the tumor marker. If the thyroglobulin continues to go up, but we don't see anything in the neck, then I start doing either a CT scan of the lungs to see if there's anything there, or one could think about an iodine whole body scan, but I tend not to do iodine whole body scan until I know where the disease is. If it's in the neck, I take a surgical approach, or sometimes we take at the Mayo Clinic an alcohol approach, but not oral. We inject little tiny positive lymph nodes with ethanol, and that helps treat them and can avoid surgery. So we really need some imaging and follow-up over time to find this. Your story sounds like it's more slow growing and not high risk, so that's optimistic, but you really just need good follow-up. And there's no urgency to go with iodine and scans right now other than ultrasounds and follow-up. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Um, let's see, we'll go to Penny. I have stage one papillary thyroid cancer. My surgery was in 2019, positive margins. My endo wanted to do REI, the radiologist, maybe the radiation oncologist, um, second opinion said no REI. I haven't done REI. My TG goes up and down, but has never been over one. Is there anything I should consider else when deciding on REI? I am playing, am I playing Russian roulette or is this delay following current protocols? So great question, Penny. So this is, again, um, what we would call low-risk disease, and the thyroglobulin could be representing residual normal thyroid tissue that's left behind. The thyroglobulin can fluctuate mildly up and down based on your TSH level. So when TSH goes up, thyroglobulin goes up. When TSH comes down, thyroglobulin often comes down. Um, so it may not be um, a worrisome sign. And the fact that the number is under one is very reassuring uh, to me. So as long as you get good ultrasounds for the next five years with good lymph node mapping, if there's no structural disease and if the tumor marker is not rising above one, I think you've made a reasonable choice to um, uh, defer radioiodine. And I think your prognosis from both Mayo Clinic MESA scoring system and from TNM current classifications and all of our data suggests that your prognosis is excellent. And I think you're likely to do quite well. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance, Penny. Um, Richard has a question. Um, with genomic testing, can the mutation results change if you take more than one test over a handful of years? Um, I'm not sure I'm completely understanding this, but there is, so if your question is, can genomics change over time for the tumors, for the thyroid cancer? So, a way of answering that is to say that the primary mutation or the driver, say BRAF, that doesn't generally change. That tends to be in the primary tumor. And as the tumor spreads, it tends to be retained in other tumors in the lung or bone metastases. But what may happen in those other seedlings, perhaps from the primary tumor in the lung or in the bone or liver, is that those can evolve to acquire additional mutations that could be TERT, that could be ARID, that could be additional mutations that make the cancer even more aggressive. So yes, sometimes as the tumor progresses or in some patients whose disease has been quiescent and all of a sudden there's a new rapidly growing change in a lung nodule, or there's a new mass and it's growing fast, we would biopsy that and consider genomics on that to help understand what's driving this change in phenotype or behavior. Hopefully I answered your question correctly. 
Um, Hugo has a question. What can it mean if thyroid cancer does not light up in a diagnostic whole body scan, but lights up in a later therapeutic scan? Last year, CT scan found nodules in my lung. The spec CT was negative. Doctors were worried the lung nodules were not REI avid. Um, I got surgery, got a second round of radioiodine. After a therapeutic dose, the lung nodules lit up beautifully. What gives? So Hugo, I'm not sure your age. You might be able to type or tell us your age, but some patients who primarily it ends up being the younger patients in their 20s who have tiny lung nodules, because the lung nodules are so tiny, they don't take up and concentrate enough of the, of the diagnostic scan. The diagnostic dose that we use is a thousandfold or a hundredfold much lower than the therapeutic dose. When you give 100 or 150 millicuries, that's enough iodine that such the post-therapy scan might light up a lot more than the pre-therapy scan. So I-131 is common for this because the diagnostic scan on I-131 may miss tiny things, but yet you give 150 millicuries and the post-therapy scan could light up. We use I-123 that is very sensitive actually, both the pre and post-therapy scan are most often consistent and I rarely find new disease. But there are exceptions and some post-therapy scans do light up much more brightly than the pre-therapy scan. All right, let's see how much time we have. We've got a lot, we have a few minutes. So I think I'm gonna go through at least this question and we'll see, might be at the end of the time. So Christopher's asking thyroidectomy, four centimeters, end tract fusion, no RAI, just TSH suppression, stable for three years. Since there are targeted therapies available, is there still a point for RAI with the risks that come with that as opposed to active monitoring? Um, I suppose REI could be used later if the cancer grows. Is active monitoring and TSH suppression and intermediate risk cancer appropriate? So I think Christopher, you do, um, it is very appropriate to do surveillance. If the disease has not spread outside of the neck, meaning to the lungs or bones, then I think surveillance alone is all you probably need. The NTRAC fusion is a gold mine. So you've sort of hit the lottery in that respect because it's not a common mutation, but that fusion has a targeted treatment where if push comes to shove or the disease changes its course, you do have an excellent treatment option to both control the disease. Those treatments that target your fusion could be used to restore iodine uptake. There was at least, I think, one paper editorial in New England Journal of a patient with an NTRAC fusion, I believe, that had restoration of iodine uptake. These are in patients with distant disease. For patients whose disease are confined to the neck, we typically take a surgical approach, or again at the Mayo Clinic alcohol approach, to inject a few one or two lymph nodes with ethanol to help control um, the neck disease. So, um, so if you've not received iodine, I think that's okay. But if the disease comes back, certainly the question would be try iodine first. And then if the iodine doesn't work and the disease grows, then your n tract fusion could be a very attractive target to help control the cancer, maybe even restore iodine uptake. Okay. Um, Dr. Ryder, I'm being told we can go over by two to three minutes. So if that gives you time to quickly answer another okay. question. Okay, sure. So Emily, short question. PTC, tall cell, my surgeon did not have my tissue genetic te genetically tested. Can any genetic testing be done now? Um, so if this is a tall cell variant or tall cell features, Emily, there's a very good chance it is BRAF mutant. Again, 90% of tall cell variants are BRAF mutant. Remember, 60% of all papillary thyroid cancers are also BRAF mutants. So BRAF alone doesn't mean you're radioiodine resistant per se. There are exceptions of BRAF mutant PTCs that are might respond well to radioiodine. Um, but it does, um, when you start to see PTC develop tall cells, 
it does tend to suggest disease that be, could be have higher rates of recurrence and be more aggressive. So good follow-up is important. Um, and yes, you can do genetic testing to confirm the BRAF, but I don't know that you need that treatment right away. We would like to see those who we go on to radioiodine um, therapy or radioiodine redef have high thyroglobulins or have structural disease in the lungs or bones, and that's when we primarily use iodine. If you had a lot of high-risk disease in the neck, you could also consider an adjuvant dose of iodine as standard of care um, or in a BRAF-targeted manner. So if genomic testing only showed TERT, is Rediff therapy possible option in REI-resistant HCC, Herthel cell thyroid cancer with METs to the lung and possible HIP? So thanks for your question, uh, Tracy. This is a tough one, and um, I have another fellow who has collected a database of about 300 patients with Herthel cell thyroid cancer, and our specific question is what you're asking here, in a sense, is what percentage of Herthel cell thyroid cancers are sensitive to radioactive iodine? And unfortunately, we've learned from other groups that Herthel cell thyroid cancers have a completely different genomics than typical thyroid cancers, papillary and follicular, that their genomics are, are often mitochondrial mutations, so um, mutations in what we call mitochondria of the cell, different than the nucleus. And our data shows so far that most Herthel cells do not either take up iodine, or even if they take up some iodine, those minority that do often don't respond to I-131. So this is a little bit complicated. It's not in the guidelines, um, but by and large, the um, Herthel cell thyroid cancers are resistant to radioiodine. We do not include Herthel cells in our rediff approach because we really don't know the biology of what makes these resistant to radioactive iodine. It's likely something very different than what we talked about for papillary and for, for follicular. And I really am using very limited to potentially no iodine for Herthel cell, but that's a non-standard approach as yet. Um, I do a lot of thyroid cancer, so my approach is different than many. Um, so you should really talk with your oncologist and your endocrinologist um, well. But I'm not, um, I do not include Herthel cell in my redifferentiation cohorts of patients. Um, Tina, thank you for the comment. Great presentation. I hope it was helpful. Um, and let's see, I think we'll take- we, prob um, we probably, if you do one more quick one, we probably will have time for that and then we'll have to close out, unfortunately. I'm sorry, there's so many of you in here with so many questions and we yeah. wish we could keep you another hour. I know. So I'm going to go. There's, um, would you recommend dabrafenib and trametinib before lenvatinib slash serafinib? Are there studies? Um, so again, this is a very individualized approach. Um, it depends on your age. It depends on other comorbidities, um, what good shape you're in. It depends on your extent of disease. But the for example, if I have an older patient who's a bit more frail, I might start dabrafenib and trametinib first as opposed to starting lenvatinib first. I do not use serafinib very often, certainly not as first line treatment, but it could be a second or third line option. Um, so I really am thinking about lenvatinib or dabrafenib and trametinib. And now that dabrafenib and trametinib have become FDA approved, um, and easier to get, it is a real discussion with patients. And I actually present both options to patients. We weigh the risks and benefits of each option of lenvatinib versus dabrafenib and trametinib. If it's a patient that I'm thinking about redifferentiation on, then dabrafenib and trametinib might be an attractive option. So, um, and there are studies on dabrafenib and trametinib um, and outcomes in thyroid cancer. So yes, there is data to show that they're, they're effective, but no head-to-head -head study comparing lenvatinib versus uh, dabrafenib. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ryder. Um, oh, you're welcome. Sorry I can't get to everybody's questions um, I know, I know. as always. 
So I would like to remind everyone, though, that this conference continues. The next set of sessions start at 530 Eastern, 230 Pacific time. So we hope you'll jump into some of those sessions um, and be sure and check out the auction. They've got some great items. Um, uh, and I'm sure that there will be other sessions where you can continue to get some of your questions answered. So check out that schedule. Uh, I want to thank all of you for, for being here. And I want to thank the doctor for her amazing knowledge. Um, and we hope to see you in some other sessions. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's a spectacular session. I think this is just amazing. And I really don't know other support, um, like uh, other cancer types that are really well um, versed like this. So very savvy Absolutely. questions and very savvy audience. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everyone. Hope to yeah. see you at some other sessions.